Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Fernando Antunes. I'm a social worker, and it is my pleasure, it is my honor to be in this space with y'all and introduce you to advancing the legal protections of youth through a multidisciplinary lens. I have the honor of presenting with managing attorney Stephanie Arzaga. And in the next 40, 35 minutes, we hope to leave you with a better understanding of how LSC or Legal Services for Children approaches a multidisciplinary um, practice, our work in detention centers, our work in detention centers, promoting healing centered care in our advocacy and service. And most importantly, inviting you all to apply an appropriate multidisciplinary approach in your work. I'm sure I speak for Stephanie and I when I say that we're both really excited to have this conversation with you all. Um, so let's begin. Like many journeys, this one starts at home. So to start things off, I'll invite Stephanie Arzaga to tell you a little bit more about legal services for children and our multidisciplinary approach. Uh, buenos dias. Um, so Legal Services for Children is a nonprofit organization in San Francisco, California. We were established in 1975 uh, and we provide free legal services to children and youth uh, who require legal assistance to stabilize their lives and realize their full potential. Uh, we have three practice areas and we mainly work within uh, education, specifically expulsion defense in San Francisco County, dependency and guardianship. We work with dependent youth in foster care in San Francisco County, uh, and we assist young people in seeking legal guardianships uh, with adult caregivers in San Francisco County and Alameda County. And we also work with immigration. Uh, so we work primarily with youth in detention, as well as youth formerly detained and youth out in the community in San Francisco County. Uh, our approach um, is a holistic model approach consisting of attorney and social workers. Each child that we represent and work with is assigned an attorney and a social worker. And together we work collaboratively to achieve the goals of young people. We also work within a stated interest model in which we advocate for the youth's stated interest uh, um, unopposed to their best interest model because we believe that young people are the best to articulate what it is they wish to achieve. And we work collaboratively together to ensure that young people achieve their goals and their full potential to essentially stabilize their lives at home, to have education success, and to free themselves from detention and deportation. So before we tell you uh, more in depth about the work that Stephanie and I do on a regular basis, I think it's important to open up with some fundamental principles that guide our work. Our attorneys understand that if our attorney, if they become just another adult that is seeking to extract information from youth, that meeting is gonna go very short, very quick. As we share our approach, we ask you to consider um, how uh, clear expectations uh, of impact the relationship building. We ask you to keep in mind how being in tune with your own emotions when meeting with some with me when meeting with a youth and being in tune and attentive to their emotions can impact the relationship. And finally, uh, how the desire for control and the opportunity for facilitation 
impact the relationship between the youth and yourself. Uh, we'll speak more about these in depth later on in the presentation. So in order to contextualize uh, the work that we do, I'm going to do kind of a brief overview of what young people go through in their journey to the United States. Um, as it's been mentioned in many, many of the sessions in this, um, at this conference, young people are displaced and or flee their home countries for various reasons. Um, and a lot of the times they have suffered some sort of trauma and or harm and endure dangerous journeys to make it to their final destination, wherever that may be. Once young people have fled their home country, are in transit into the United States, an attempt to enter into the United States and return themselves over to um, Custom Border Patrol officers at the U.S.-Mexican border, usually, um, they are encountered with officers, officers who are in full gear, uh, bullet, bulletproof vest, who are armed and who are uniformed, not necessarily the most friendliest of faces. <laughs> so young people are further policed and questioned by CBP officers who don't necessarily have welcoming arms when speaking to young people and who don't have the tools to address young people in a healing centered way often questioning why they are coming and often um, making them feel lesser than after young people have uh, entered and have been processed by custom border patrol they are then transferred to the office of refugee and resettlement this is the agency that takes custody of undocumented immigrant youth once they are in the United States. Again, once in custody, young people are further um, criminalized in a sense. Uh, it's very difficult for young people to understand why they are being detained, why their freedom is being restrained. And even though they have access to medical care, mental health services, food, and other um, and other rights while in detention, it is still very much detention. They're not free to go. They're not free to go wherever they please or do or say whatever they pleased. They are very much observed constantly. They are under constant observation. Everything that they say, everything that they do, is recorded in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it's very difficult for them to understand and or comprehend why they are in the situation that they are in. And after that, after being in these centers, which is supposed to be for a short term period of time, they are then released to a sponsor. Usually they reunify with a family member in the United States. And that in itself can be a huge adjustment. It's adjusting to a whole new country, adjusting to a whole new language, even just adjusting within a new home. Sometimes young people, their parents left when they were babies. They have no actual physical relationship with their parent. So that in itself can be an adjustment to then have to live with this adult and engage with this adult and develop a new relationship with this adult that they have not had in their life ever. So after all of that, then I'm supposed to meet with them as an attorney and ask them, so what happened in your home country? Why are you here? How can I help you? Let's talk about trauma. So that in itself is just to show and contextualize everything that young people are going through before they even get to speak to advocates they can assist them and support them in their cases to seek legal relief and protection and freedom from detention and deportation in the united states um, so i will pass it off to fernando who will speak more about how we approach and meet with young people in these settings to go further in depth about what the kind of the kind of a healing centered trauma informed care looks like in such a hostile 
environment in such a hostile context, um, I'd like to invite the voices of mental health professionals at Stanford University to speak more on techniques for trauma-informed interviewing. Uh, Adolescents make up the majority of children detained in U.S. Uh, facilities. Adolescents may experience traumatic events like the death of a family member quite differently than young children. Interviewers need to be patient and understanding and at the same time be sensitive to red flags that these children are in urgent need of mental health intervention. Adolescents present a particular challenge. They do not engage readily with adults. And when they're going through situations like this, sometimes they tend to withdraw and become more isolated. It takes time to connect with them. Spend that time. Ask something about themselves. Ask about what they like to do. Ask about where they came from. If you know a popular artist or a song, uh, a folk song maybe, uh, if you can connect over that, those little things help you to build the trust. Things like knowing the main cities in their countries or the different languages or dialects that are spoken. Make sure you give the child time to respond to each question. Don't rush them with their answers. We want to let the child determine the pace of the interview. They don't have to tell you a thing when you first meet them. You wouldn't tell a stranger. Give them time. Ana was a 16-year-old girl fleeing violence in El Salvador. After crossing the border, she was picked up. In the interest of time, we will um, ask Anna for her story uh, another day. We heard some really important uh, strategies and principles for trauma-informed interviewing. Um, now I'd like for us to tighten our focus on specific strategies. Uh, one important thing to, to keep in mind uh, is uh, a youth and really anyone's uh, desire to be seen, heard, and ultimately understood. But the question of the hour is, how do you do that? Uh, so uh, with this, I like to re I'd like to return to our opening principles. Um, when I asked you all to consider introduction and introductions and their impact on uh, a relational, the relational dimension of the meeting, of the work. I mean to say uh, beyond, uh, so clear expectations look like you starting with who you are, of course, clearly explaining who you are and what you are here, what are you are hoping to accomplish, but it's important to explain in language that the youth understands why it's important to you. Right? Why might it, might it be important to them to um, work with you and um, explore the information that you that you're proposing to explore? Right. Clear expectations are important because there's a lot of a lot of things that we might want to protect the the youth from, but the truth should not be one of them. Uh, further, uh, I'd like to focus on engagement and rapport building. It's important to be, or rather, actually, no. I'd like to focus on engagement and rapport building. Uh, and when I, when I emphasize that, I invite you all to consider uh, how you can maintain composure within yourself, how you can monitor your emotions. It's important to be aware of your internal reactions. And I'm going to push against the um, prevailing understanding that it's important for you to hide 
contain and minimize your emotions because the focus is on the youth and their emotions. I believe it's a little more complicated than that. I think there's power in harnessing your emotions when appropriate and safe to elicit opportuni opportunities for safety. There's a fine line between harnessing an appropriate emotional connection and having the youth hold on to your emotions and have to make sense of your emotions. Uh, and so it's important to, to find that balance so that you can find that connection, find that relationship, and still make the, make the youth, make the child understand that this is about them. This is their time. Um, and, and I'd like to invite Stephanie to share an example of what that can look like. Um, yes, uh, as Fernando mentioned, it's very important to allow the young person to take control of the narrative because it is their story. The best person that can say what happened, what their life is, who they are, is them. I only speak for them, advocate for them. I'm not another adult talking at them. Uh, an example that comes a lot with the young teenage boys that I work with is many times I meet with them in silence. We will sit in silence for 30 minutes. I will review with them what I want to talk with them about. I will review with them where their case is at. I would review with them what is the next steps. And I name that it's up to them if they want to work on that today. And sometimes they are very blunt and upfront and they say no. And that's okay. And sometimes that's all it takes. There was a young person that I worked with many years ago where I showed up every single Tuesday to meet with them at the detention center. And every single Tuesday, he refused to meet with me. And slowly we would meet and then we would sit in silence. And by the fifth or sixth time, he's like, you're really not going anywhere, are you? And I was like, nope, I'm still here you tell me when you want to talk. And we did. And now we've been working together for six years. So again, it's about meeting the child where they are at. Even if it's uncomfortable for you, sitting in silence is not fun. But it's all about them and observing them and being receptive to what they are saying to you because a lot was said in those moments of silence. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, silence can evoke a lot of emotions. Uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing that example. Uh, similar to how uh, remaining composed is about you, remaining compassionate is about them. That's why we believe it's important to avoid labels. We may come in with our expertise of uh, legal problems, uh, psychosocial problems and we're really excited to share that information because we believe that information is power right knowledge is power knowledge can take the form of silence knowledge can take the form of anger uh, we'll speak more to that later but um, avoiding labels is about letting the youth arrive to their truth um, youth spend a large portion of their lives being told about themselves what they feel, what they're saying, what they think, but don't want to say. Uh, instead, we encourage you to the, um, an, a way to avoid labeling these thoughts, these behaviors, these actions for youth. We invite you to ask, or sorry, ask. Ask them to name the behaviors, thoughts, emotions for themselves. Um, one thing, uh, yes, so uh, it's important to avoid labels. Uh, another important component of being compassionate with youth is authentic, uh, sharing authentic affirmations. Okay. Uh, 
when we say authentic affirmations, we want to emphasize that youth are human lie detectors. Uh, youth can tell when you're lying, even when you're not. So it's important to strive towards authentic, specific, and small, whenever they can be, affirmations. Acknowledge their work. Validate their experience. This, too, is a compliment. It doesn't have to be this grand gesture of uh, that's a one-stop shop for their self-confidence, the uh, uh, encouraging, almost imposing trust onto them. A relational approach to the work means trusting the process and moving at the speed of trust. As I mentioned before, uh, knowledge and expertise it can take the form of anger, can take the form of tears, and it can take the form of silence. The balance between facilitation and control is an important one because we believe that control is how we can determine the outcome, how we can account for the unaccountable. Um, but facilitation is a very positive alternative because facilitation is about letting the expertise that the, both the youth and you have to build the road ahead together. Uh, yes, it's important to, to balance out the, uh, embrace the uh, ability to ride the wave of those emotions and identify the knowledge and the um, wisdom in those emotions, it's important to balance that out with a responsible um, monitoring for consent. Uh, it's important to pay attention to nonverbal cues. Uh, some of which we're, we're all familiar with, uh, such as no eye contact. Maybe a youth is having trouble regulating their limbs, you know kicking their legs, moving their arms. Uh, and if you notice that they have trouble processing new information, uh, those are, are invitations to ask for consent. Do you want a break? Do you want to continue today? Uh, would another day be, be better? Uh, ultimately, consent is about trust. And um, so I'd like to take a moment to, to um, focus on how trust is central to uh, moving the work. A youth isn't going to share uh, some of the more important, the uh, Im more impactful parts of their stories about their experience, of their experiences if they don't trust you. Uh, Stephanie told us about all of the people that these youth meet before uh, they, they arrive at the detention centers where we meet with them. Uh, and each one of those people is one can potentially be one more reason not to trust us. Uh, but approaching something concrete like legal services through a multidisciplinary lens means taking a relational approach, uh, collaborating with the youth. When you're ready, we're right here. So for, for any social workers in the audience, um, this might be more of a review, but um, I'd like to take a moment to speak on motivational interviewing uh, as a specific technique to take away with you, regardless uh, of whether or not you work directly with youth, uh, consider how um, sitting in silence can be an invitation for strategies like this. Motivational interviewing is about engaging. Engaging means starting with that common foundation. Why are we here and what are we doing? Seems pretty uh, redundant, but I promise you that explicitly establishing those expectations, that common understanding of what brings us to this moment, 
is crucial to moving forward. After engaging, um, I invite you all to consider how to focus the conversation. Okay, we know why we're here and we know what we could be doing, but what do we want to do? As the name might imply, motivational interviewing is about harnessing motivation. And as you might have already guessed, it's about harnessing the motivation of the person that we're meeting with, the, the youth. Yes. Um, and so focusing is about um, with that comment, with that shared context, uh, what does the youth actually want to do? They might not want to tell you their story, but maybe they're interested in understanding more about uh, uh, visas and what, how long they're, they're going to be in this detention center. Even if you don't have the answers, motivational interviewing is again about harnessing their expertise as well. What have they been, what have they been experiencing? Do they feel, uh, do they, have they identified anyone that they're comfortable sharing these complaints, these frustrations with? That is a form of focusing too. Um, and that actually leaks into the third step of uh, motivational interviewing, and that's evoking. Uh, evoking is about um, harnessing the youth's motivations, their values, their resources, um, in order to energize them for, for whatever the next step may be. In our context, it's um, communicating that legal legal context and uh, possibly interviewing them for for uh, visas uh, to remain in the United States that they might be eligible for. Uh, in your context, it might be different, but again, motivational interviewing is finding these little opportunities to harness their motivation and excitement about change or the next step. Um, once you have that energy and you're just ready to run and and make the biggest change in your own life um, i encourage you to uh, follow the next step which is plan you might want to take that motivation and try everything all at once but again uh, inviting the philosophy of moving at the speed of trust planning is about um, visualizing really concretely and detail oriented what does that next step look like because change is hard it's important to go slow because when you may or may not invariably falter uh, or not go as quick as you want that can that can uh, evoke feelings of frustration of discouragement and so uh, another important element of motivational interviewing is start from the beginning as many times as you need, because failure is not the end of the story. It's just another beginning. Um, and finally, uh, if you're still feeling lost, if you, if you find yourself uh, working with, with youth directly, uh, we encourage you to remember these four uh, four specific strategies in interviewing and interacting with youth. Um, an emphasis on open-ended questions. Uh, please, please, please avoid the yes or no, uh, because that is another way that the conversation can turn very short, very quick. Uh, accurate affirmations, as I said before is about finding the little pieces of sunshine that that the youth is is um, is is uh, presenting to you is sharing with you. Thank you so much for meeting with me. Uh, I really appreciate you being patient with this information. I know it can be a little boring sometimes. Um, and balance that out with an avoidance of toxic positivity. It's so easy to, in moments, in difficult moments, in frustrating moments, to say, well, hey, it could be worse. It's, you know, it, look on the bright side. Um, we encourage you to avoid that toxic positivity because that is another way that the meeting can turn very short, very quick, 
it can deteriorate that relationship building. Um, third is reflective listening. Uh, when, for those of you that aren't familiar with reflective listening, I ask you to consider what a therapist might say. Uh, for example, it sounds like you're being told what to do all the time. What makes, what makes that make, um, this makes you feel like you're not being listened to. A lot of people hear that and say, yeah, that's what I just said. Um, but what you're doing is actively listening and, and reflecting back their truths as an opportunity, as an invitation to say more. Or did I get it wrong? Maybe you can correct me. Uh, again, encouraging, inviting, making space for the expertise in the room, all of the expertise in the room. Um, and finally, summarizing. Uh, summarizing is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, after a youth has shared, uh, uh, maybe their experience, uh, maybe some feedback on what you're saying, um, summarize it back to them. Uh, this, this is a way to avoid silence, to avoid the awkwardness of well, what do we do now? Summarizing looks like um, you're unsure about applying for a visa because you would have to share very personal information to a room full of strangers. And that's it. Pausing for silence after that is again another invitation for uh, the expertise, the curiosity, the motivation that the youth possesses. Um, and so finally, uh, I'd like to, on that note, I'd like to, I'd like to remind you all that uh, youth are always communicating, even when they're not. So please continue to listen. Uh, thank you so much, Fernando. Um, and again, really the goal for us in using a holistic model and a student interest model is to allow young people to be interactive in making this decision. Unfortunately, they are in need of legal assistance for whatever reason. And we want to ensure that they have control, that they have a say, that they can name and ask what it is they truly want in their case. And that is what we collaborate and we'll collaborate work together as attorneys and social workers in supporting young people in meeting their overall goal. Because ultimately it's their case, it's not ours, and we are but a vessel speaking on their behalf in spaces, but it's always their voice and it's always about uplifting their voice. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, do we have time for questions? Okay. So um, we will just want like to open uh, for just questions um, for folks, um, for Fernando and I. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a question and a comment. Do you hold any workshops? Do you train for this? what you just shared because it is very important. Now, my comment is, even though it's not exactly related to legal aspect, it's more in a migration aspect, maybe everyone seeks to find quick solutions. Don't keep the children for too long there because you need to determine what's going to be their outcome. And that is what we sometimes don't understand that this will take time whether it's an assisted return or a protection scheme, it would also take time. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that from the authority's lens, there are two things. We tend to think that those who are well uh, prof the professionals and they're very well trained, like psychologists, they are able to do this work. But in fact, they need to be trained in how to work with young adults. Reason why I asked at the beginning about trainings. Now, my last comment, 
giving you a sense of the government side of things, there's a lot of stress. Professionals are under a lot of stress that they're not able to control their emotions. They're exposed to this every three minutes. So it is very hard uh, finding ways to control those emotions. So I think this is a great area of opportunity to work directly with civil um, society, international organizations, in order to provide the support to these professionals, it, not only for the boys and girls and the youth, but also for these professionals to learn how to handle their own emotions and to be able to work with their own traumas many times. Dear colleagues, I'm always happy to hear the fabulous work carried out by Legal Services for Children in San Francisco. In fact, I was able to, to be with you once. The perspective that you bring to the table as to what is happening in the United States with these boys, girls, and the youth that arrive to the United States is very important. We have heard the situation from Mexico and from the situation in Central America and South America. So this perspective that you bring to the table, it just, it's just a continuity, uh, it just provides continuity to what we're already working on. We know that we're working in Mexico, but we also know that on the other side of talking about the, the side, the other border, the other side of the border, they're also working and we are aligned and you're working both aspects, boys and girls, but you're also working in protecting those who work with those boys and girls. So knowing that the United States is working on this, it's definitely rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. Thank you very much. I would like to build on what the colleague just said. Training is important. In fact, you presented a very complete and clear intervention map, and it will be very good to be trained. Now, my concern is regarding the families, the families where these children are come from. Is there any point along this accompaniment process in which the families are involved? Because I can only imagine the level of tension and stress from the families understanding that these children have gone through so many things. So I would like to know, how do you intervene in terms to families? The support system that the young people has at home is always part of the conversations in regards to how we do advocacy for the young people in a certain manner. Sometimes they're not part of the conversation. What is very important for us is to let the youth know that the case belongs to them. It doesn't belong to your dad. It doesn't belong to your mom. It doesn't belong to your sister. It belongs to you, and you decide what you want to do. Because I had a lot of customers that they tried, well, you tell me what I should do. You tell me which is the best option for me. Well, you're the expert. You let me know what I should do. And no, that is not my role. My role is to inform you in regards to all the options, to give you all the information that I can give you, that you can make a decision in regards to your case, and you can do it informed. And this is like with a social worker, and we process information together many times before we proceed. And sometimes this will include, do you want me to have a conversation with your mom to explain the steps to her? Let's come together, all four of us. Let us speak in regards to this. If you want Fernando to be present, Fernando will be there. Well, Fernando always has to be there. So to have these conversations, group conversations, that they can understand it's a team. This is your support team. We are the ones that are helping you, that you can make this decision. But at the end of the day, who is going to make the decision? It's you. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Fernando, for the presentation. And I, I, I really liked what you said about um, remembering that the, these children come with a journey and many experiences before, you know, we even start interviewing. And on one point, you mentioned about interviewing young teenage boys and the whole question of silence and all of that. I, I just had a question because many of our members that work in, in these um, services, they said that sometimes they also work with 
especially teenage adolescent boys that have struggles with help seeking behaviors because of gender norms and, and gender roles. And so silence is one thing, but there is also an issue of uh, um, aggressive behaviors or, or complex behaviors that can also make the social worker or the, or the lawyer or the legal person feel uncomfortable. So, and, and, and it's for us is something that our members are sharing all the time and that they would really like to have guidance on this. So yeah, just wanted to hear what's your experience and if it's something you're working on and as the colleague said, if you also have any guidance or toolkits or anything, that would be fantastic. Thank you. I, I, I really like that question. Thank you so much for inviting the, the question of safety. Um, I, I, I would like to tie it back to the question of um, clear expectations, because again, as much as we would like to uh, be everything to this for this young person, uh, clear expectations help help ensure uh, safety as well. Um, drawing those boundaries that protect. The, the the attorney or the social worker's safety um, from the beginning from the beginning maybe I didn't uh, uh, emphasize the importance of of, of the um, clear expectations being the starting point um, whenever you're com whenever you feel your safety your comfort uh, is compromised not so challenged I think there's an important distinction there um, Whenever you feel your safety and your comfort is compromised and you no longer feel comfortable, you no longer feel safe, um, that's part of expectations too. Uh, dis uh, one other thing that I, I would like to add is it's important to not leave a youth, uh, I can't think of another way to say it, dysregulated, uh, a youth in that heightened emotional state because then that's the last impression that you get in the room. So finding a balance depending on your container, uh, depending on the area that you work in, uh, between ensuring your safety and that not being negotiable. But also, again, the focus is on the youth, uh, making sure that they have an opportunity to come down from that heightened emotional state, whether it be sadness, whether it be anger, um, is is important too. Uh, I we don't have time for specific strategies, but that's a lovely conversation that I, I invite any and everyone to to um, come afterwards and, and have with me. Thank you. Regarding the principles that you have spoken about today are very interesting, but the expectations are are something that we all we we built on, but we also build a trust. And um, with this, I can say that we face many challenges. And that is why I want to pose my question, because many times you say it is your decision. It is you that build your outcomes. And we are working on in, in conditions in which many of those young adults don't even know how to make decisions they've never been in a situation in which they have to make in a decision or not even an informed decision so it is important to talk about expectation and trust and to understand the whole process as a learning curve but it's also important to to help them when defining what they want to achieve. And it's not just to say, you know, I need your, to, you to make a decision because in fact, I just want to walk out of here. I can't just sit and wait for you. Um, in one way or another, the, what I use a lot is repetition. And repetition is simply review, revisit everything that I have talked to the child or the youth uh, from the beginning. And I ask them, repeat what you, uh, could you tell me what you understood from this? Many times I sit with them for one hour, one hour and a half, and I ask them at the end, what did you understand? What did you grasp from our conversations? And many times I just hear silence. So when that happens, I simply go back, I share the information again, and then I ask the child, what were you able to get from my conversation or from what I've just shared? So like Francisco just said, this is a 
yes, we have a map or a road map in order to achieve that final goal. But many times the attainment of that goal might take five years. So we have to go little by little, and it is very important to get from the child or from the youth, what are they understanding from what I'm sharing? What I've understood from, from the youth that I've worked with is that it is very difficult for them to process the information, or it's very hard for them to share certain information. In fact, I've, I'm, I was working with a young adult that it wasn't until the fourth year that he, that child shared information that was crucial for his case. And I told him, well, you should have told me from year one, but I'm still here to help. So this is a learning curve, not just for us, but also for them. Many times when they have gone through so much um, hurt, hurt or violence, it's because adults are hurting them, are inflicting that violence. So when they have another adult, it's hard for them to open up and to speak to them. And many times uh, um, how they perceive adults is that it's an individual that is there to tell them what they have to do. So it takes time for that child to understand that they are there to make a decision for their cases. In other words, to empower them. Sometimes I don't even agree to the decisions that they make, but that is why it is important to have informed decision. Now, I can I can share the information with them and go back to what they have shared with me. For example, you if you want to return to your country, please be reminded that you fled your country. You are exposed to, let's say, violence. You don't have a place to go back to. So is this what you want? And if it is what you want, then it's going to take X amount of months for this to happen. Reason why I asked them, let me know what you understand from what I I'm bringing to the table what I'm presenting to you. And when they speak back or report back what they have learned, then we're we'll able to understand that we're all on the same page. Any other questions? If we don't have any other questions, then I would like to add something that's very important for those who don't have the luxury to work for a young adult for four years. I would like to invite you to consider who else is going to be working with that child in the long term, who has been working with that child, and if possible or whenever possible, invite them to the interview. That way there's an agreement or the context is also shared with the individual that's going to follow up on, on that youth's case. That way we create that connection or that bridge with other type of services and agencies and it becomes more interactive. Okay, with this, I think we are done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.